Hello, and welcome to Raising the Bar with the MBBA. I'm your co-host, Adiola Adejobi. And I'm Jason Clark, president of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. So the MBBA is the largest association of predominantly African-American attorneys in New York. Our goal is advancing equality in the pursuit of justice, assisting in the professional development of our members, and addressing legal issues affecting New Yorkers. The goal of raising the bar with the MBBA is to foster a substantive conversation about justice issues within our community and to try to identify a couple of solutions in the process. Today, we're going to talk about health disparities in the Black community in the era of COVID-19. And uh, with that said, we have a special uh, guest with us today, Dr. Oni Blackstock, uh, Assistant Commissioner for the New York City Health Department uh, Bureau of HIV. So uh, welcome and thank you for uh, joining us, uh, Dr. Blackstock. Thanks so much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. As you know, and as we all know, um, the world's kind of been um, upside down recently. <laughs> And everything that we've been seeing, uh, you know, first when it started with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, and then, you know, a lot of the, um, the uh, civil unrest that's uh, resulted as a result of the deaths of uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and so many before. Um, one of the things though, I mean, it's actually kind of as a, uh, a friend of mine had described it, it's almost like we have a pandemic within a pandemic. And uh, one of the things I think we're starting to forget about is really the role that inequities within our healthcare justice plays in exacerbating a, uh, a pandemic such as the one that we're dealing with now. We're hoping that maybe we can start by talking about some of the inequities that we see in healthcare. Uh, you know, the clearest example is, you know, an inequitable access to the actual healthcare and being refused medical treatment. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what we saw at the beginning of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, where it sounded like there may be certain folks who had access to treatment while others did not? Um, I think, as you were suggesting, the, the COVID-19 pandemic really laid bare the existing disparities and inequities that we were aware of um, prior to this, um, but sort of like put a, a light on them. So I, at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw that testing was very limited for many people. Um, but in particular, we found that, um, particularly for, for Black people, um, that there were anecdotes and now increasing like quantitative data um, that um, Black people were more likely to be refused uh, testing um, as compared to other groups of people testing for COVID-19. As you remember, as you may remember at the beginning of the pandemic, like testing was very, capacity for testing was very limited. And there were very like strict criteria in terms of who could get tested. So for instance, um, you obviously had to have fever, cough, chills, shortness of breath, but you also had to have traveled to a region of the world that was experiencing um, the pandemic at the time. So China, I think Italy, Iran. And so just because of, you know, Sort of differential sort of resources that people have. You know, Black people are less likely to be traveling to many of these parts of the world and we're less likely to have been eligible for testing. Little did we know that by that time, you know, community um, spread was, was very pervasive um, and that testing should not have been limited to only people who had traveled to those regions of the world. Right. And so, you know, in addition to that, I want to talk about um, funding and how that plays into this. So, once COVID started getting out of hand, the federal government started allocating funding to medical institutions to help treat patients. However, certain types of medical institutions received more funding than others. Um, what role did this play in making it harder for some individuals to receive proper medical care? Right, so we already know even prior to the pandemic that um, hospitals and clinics in um, lower income areas, in, and because class is so tied to race in this country in black and Latino areas, uh, were much more likely to be underfunded, understaffed, um, and thus unprepared for when this pandemic hit. And then when we think about um, support from the federal government, so many of the sort of the calculations to, to decide how many dollars go to a certain hospital system or clinic is really based on um, the number of beds that that hospital has, as opposed to um, looking at other factors in terms of like, um, you know, how, how impacted a community is by, by the virus or looking at sort of disparities or inequities. It was just looking at sort of just quote unquote objectively at numbers, which would not 
provide a, a true or accurate picture of what's going on. And so as a result, we had very um, large integrated healthcare systems, um, which tend not to be in neighborhoods of color, um, receiving an infusion of dollars. And then we continue to see um, many struggling community hospitals um, in black and Latino neighborhoods not receiving the same level of funding despite having a potentially even greater need in many ways because, you know, as we've seen, you know, Black and Latino people because of many reasons, but including the, the stress, the chronic stress of racism, have many more underlying conditions. Um, and so we were more likely to have severe illness when we were infected with COVID-19. We're more likely to be frontline workers again because of discriminatory, discriminatory practices and employment. Um, and so all of that sort of the confluence of all those things sort of led to this really, again, again, a, a pandemic within a pandemic and really worsening outcomes for um, people of color. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think that's uh, something that we're all seeing. And, uh, you know, it's just wild because, you know, you saw all of these statistics in the beginning talking about how uh, folks who were being, um, um, you know, folks who were, uh, for example, African-American, folks who were, uh, coming from Latinx communities, you know, they had just a dispro disproportionately higher rate of uh, of negative outcomes as a result of um, of the pandemic, and you know, just trying to figure out why these things are. So even just kind of you know harping back on that, like why why do you think um, that there were certain institutions um, like you know these safety net hospitals? Uh, weren't able to be able to um, get the same type of funding. I know we're talking about some of the hospital beds, but I mean, is that uh, indicative of, you know, some larger issues that, um, um, that, you know, we need to be addressing? Because I just worry about, you know, that this is, may happen again, right? We already hear about that there's going to be a second wave that doesn't even seem like we're done with this first wave. Um, you know, can you, I guess, talk a little bit more about, you um, what those differences are, because I don't think a lot of people even know necessarily what a safety net hospital is as compared to, you know, some of these other medical institutions. So safety net hospitals include, you know, even some of our um, public uh, city hospitals. So here in New York City, for instance, like Harlem Hospital, we know that health and health and hospitals system is, is publicly run. And we know they were hit really hard um, when the pandemic happened because many of the hospitals within H&H &H are, lo are located within communities of color, um, such as in Elmhurst, which um, had some of the highest rates of, of COVID-19. Um, we also, you know, just even just regular community hospitals that are not part of the city um, public hospital system, um, you know, just are not, do not, are not able to, um, to sort of be profitable in the same way that these large or um, integrated healthcare systems are. So like a Mount Sinai or Columbia, they're doing, you know, lots of different elective surgical procedures and it's procedures that actually bring in funding or money to hospitals because um, like a pri I'm a primary care doctor. So me talking to my patient about preventive care, like you don't get reimbursed very much, but if you do colonoscopies and endoscopies and get gallbladder removals and all of this stuff, that's what brings in the money. And so larger hospital systems are able to do that. Um, we also know that some of these safety net hospitals are more likely to see people who have um, public health insurance like Medicaid. Medicaid does not reimburse at the same level as many commercial health insurance uh, plans do. And so people with commercial health insurance are much more likely to go to these larger hospitals to get their care. And so, you know, just the revenue stream and the profit that these systems are able to make is much greater than um, some of the community hospitals that are seeing a disproportionate number of um, people who are on um, public insurance or people who are also uninsured as well um, tend to go to many of these community hospitals and safety net hospitals. So they're just, there's just a le lot less funding, a lot less staffing, less supplies and all of that. And that shouldn't be the case. Like there was um, apparently, I think Mount Sinai was able, I think Warren Buffett was able to like get a plane full of PPE to get delivered to Mount Sinai Hospital, whereas at one of the um, community hospitals in Brooklyn, like the residents had to do like a GoFundMe to get PPE. Like that should not be happening. Yeah, no, exactly. And I, I think that's what makes it difficult uh, for folks when you see, um, you, know, you know, there's this pandemic, people recognize that. And then you just start to see that certain people, you know, when they run out, you know, the, the re-upping of the, of those resources happens so much faster. And like, why should that happen for certain folks? 
um, as opposed to others. And, and by the way, um, actually, maybe we should take a second back and first just say thank you, uh, Dr. Blacksack. I mean, there are, um, you know, the folks who are essential workers or folks who are being the primary care providers, the folks who are kind of going out there and, you know, putting their own health on the lines to make sure that, you know, people in my family and Adiola's family and all of our families can be able to be safe. Um, you know, we, we say thank you sometimes, but I don't think we say enough. So first of all, so thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. It's a, it's a privilege. Um, but, but just to say that also just going back to like this, the idea of like a health, we often say we have a healthcare system and a system would be like all of these different parts coordinated and working together. And we actually don't have that. We have um, different kind of fiefdom. So like each of these different um, large hospitals, they're their own system and they don't really um, have substantial interaction in terms of, you know, the flow of, um, of information and care but among patients and things like that. So we don't really have a, a healthcare system, as you see in other countries, um, particularly in Europe, that have um, like a national health system, like in England, for instance. And the same thing with like public health. We have public health departments. I don't think we have necessarily a coordinated public health system throughout the country. Right. And that actually brings up um, a great point because there have been a lot more talk about reallocating government resources and shifting more money to prioritize uh, health care. And so um, as the government and politicians are really looking at that and trying to meet that needs, from your perspective, where do you think those resources could be best allocated mm -hmm. in order to help build a better robust healthcare system. I think the estimate is like 10 to 20% of a person's overall health is determined by the health care that they receive versus all the other social determinants of health around like housing and employment. Um, all of those things play a much greater role in terms of um, someone's health. So just to say that, um, but in terms of healthcare, um, I think clearly we need healthcare for all, um, so universal healthcare for every American. Um, healthcare um, should, is a right um, that in most um, industrialized resource countries people have, have access to. Um, and I had mentioned previously, like on, in previous talks that, you know, the Affordable Care Act really um, re reduced um, inequities in insurance coverage uh, for Black and Latino people um, in the United States. And then we also saw that that led to increased utilization of preventive care, um, overall health, um, sort of perceptions of how people view their health improve. Um, and then ultimately we're also seeing that it has improved um, health outcomes. Um, but there are many people who were not eligible for insurance um, through um, the Affordable Care Act. So people are in states that did not expand Medicaid. So many states in the South did not expand Medicaid when given the option. So people who have lower incomes in those states, even middle income, middle class income, um, are not, don't have access to insurance um, and people who are undocumented as well. So can we all pay when someone doesn't have insurance and they go to a hospital, um, eventually like the, all the costs that are involved in their, their care, eventually make their way back through the healthcare system and they make their way back to us in the form of increased premiums um, for insurance. So we all pay um, when people are not insured. And when people are not insured, they're actually more likely to delay treatment. So when people present for care, they're usually much sicker. And so the costs are much more in terms of what's needed for their health care. Um, however, if we were, if people had insurance, they could have preventive health care, which would be able to provide potential cost savings. So I would definitely say universal care for all would, would be one, one way. It wouldn't be a solution of um, decreasing some of the inequity that we see. Can you talk about the importance of preventative care? Yeah, so a lot of times we think about like a, a doctor or healthcare provider is about, um, you know, treating disease. But I think for many of us, especially those of us who are primary care doctors, it's really about um, ma maintaining and preserving health and, and well-being. Um, and so that includes things like, like getting your flu vaccinations and obviously lots of childhood vaccinations, screenings for different cancers, um, you know, for instance, um, like cervical cancer screening. Um, has been shown to really, in places where it's been implemented widely, really reduce um, the number of people um, who have cervical cancer and who ultimately die for cervical cancer. Um, and so, you know, screening is about identifying disease early so that it doesn't have a, a harmful effect on someone's overall health and lead to death. So if, we, if people had access to preventive care, 
that would prevent illness and, and sub subsequent um, premature mortality or early death. Um, so that's something that we, all Americans, I mean, this sounds like, like it just should be, it's like very clear, like all Americans should have access to healthcare and particularly preventive healthcare. Right, yeah, and I'd even imagine, uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, preventative care, when you're talking about universal health care, I mean, a whole demographic um, that we don't always think about is, you know, undocumented individuals and making sure that they have some type of access uh, to health care. And then when we kind of tether that to the idea that, you know, we have, I mean, I think there was a stat that I saw that 75% of essential workers are Black and Latinx. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we take it to that next step that, you know, there are folks who are our essential workers who are the ones who are going out, who are the ones who don't have the privilege of being able to work virtually, mm -hmm. are going out there and putting their own lives and their own health on the line. Yet, you know, there are challenges for them to actually be able to go to the hospital or to be able to get the type of medical care that they need. No, totally. And you think about people, so people are in positions where they're at increased risk, for instance, for being exposed to COVID-19, but then if people don't have, um, you know, paid sick leave or they don't have health insurance, they're going to be more likely to continue working sick, which then, you know, puts everyone else at risk as well. So, like, there are, like, clear positives to making sure that people are able to, like, take care of themselves because that has impact um, for the community. Yeah, and exactly, and then that kind of goes into even to how health is so intertwine. I mean, it's not like it just works in a, va in a vacuum. I mean, health, I imagine, you know, also relates to what your housing condition is, right? You know, it relates to, um, you know, what type of uh, meals you're able to get at home when you talk about food in uh, insecure. There, there are all these areas that, you know, it's not just, you know, you, you just go to the doctor one day and everything is okay. You know, it's all of these pieces that kind of play a role with that. And actually, one of the things that you did bring up that which I thought was interesting when you're talking about vaccines, and I believe there was a study recently even saying how there are certain folks, you know, especially like in our communities, it's based on some of these historical issues and challenges that people of color have had uh, with health. I mean, the Tuskegee, the Tuskegee experiment is one thing that certainly comes um, to mind. But the issue is like with the vaccine that uh, many folks may not even be tr um, trusting, you know, when there's a vaccine out there to actually take that medicine. I guess, can you talk a little bit in flesh this whole thing out for us a little too. Sure, yeah. So, um, right, so I think related to, if some people are aware of Tuskegee, um, but many people aren't aware of Tuskegee, they just know how they're treated in society, day-to-day um, um, -day interactions that they have, particularly when they've gone for healthcare. So there's a lot of um, medical mistrust, and of course there's there should be mistrust, as I was saying, that we thought that Black people were less likely to be tested for COVID-19. Like, this isn't in people's heads. Like, this is real. Um, and so, um, we see actually with many different types of vaccines, lower uptake, um, particularly like thinking about the flu vaccine, low up, lower uptake of the flu vaccine among black people compared to other groups of people um, out of concerns around, you know, safety, is this flu vaccine, is it gonna give me the flu? You know, people are really worried about that um, because, you know, thinking back to Tuskegee, like these were people, black men who were given syphilis um, and then followed for time to see, you know, what, um, medical complications or sequelae would develop. Um, so yeah, so people are, I think, are completely valid in these concerns that, that they have, I think, and I think we want to hold that truth, like that people have a right to be mistrustful and, you know, what we know to be true and what I would want to like share with patients is that like, especially my Black and Latino patients, is that like there are many people like studying this vaccine, um, a lot of the information so far has been like, it's, you can actually find it online, you can like read about it. I think the main thing is like being transparent about the whole process of developing vaccines, how are they gonna be tested for safety, um, as well as how well they work. So like holding space for the concerns and the worries, and then also like providing like um, factual information about um, what's happening is important. So as you were saying, like I think it was 25% of Latino people said they would not get a potential COVID-19 vaccine and about 40% of black people said they would not get a potential vaccine. And then these are the same groups that are more likely to be exposed. Um, there's a lot of studies that have come out around uh, when black women get pregnant and they're you know, going to the hospital, the way that they're treated, the fact that a lot of them are not living through childbirth, the fact that people assume that black people have um, higher 
have a higher tolerance of, for pain, right? Things that are just not true. So within the system itself, what, what would be some measures or things that you think can happen within the industry itself so that they can better serve our communities? You know, the healthcare system is just reflective of what's going on um, in society. But if we focus on the healthcare system, you know, you could think about, for instance, um, just the training that healthcare providers receive and like the, in, you know, in medical school or nursing school or school for uh, your uh, physician's assistant, you know, what are people learning about inequities and, 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 the, and you know, about structural racism and how all of this impacts sort of interpersonal interactions that they have with their patients. So I think just medical school curriculum needs to be overhauled because not enough time and attention is being paid to um, discussing these issues. And there's been like a big focus on implicit bias um, in medical schools, um, but I don't think that um, what we see is in terms of interventions or that they're, it's particularly helpful. We know that people have biases, but there aren't interventions that are effective in terms of changing these implicit biases. Um, so we need to do things that are like uh, the more structural interventions so that care can be standardized. So it's not, you know, whether someone gets pain medication isn't dependent on just the provider's assessment of whether they deserve pain, um, but, but, sorry, that whether they deserve pain treatment or not, but maybe looking at like, are, are we using scales or more like standardized protocols for like making some of these decisions so that biases um, are not playing a, as much a role and are mitigated. Because we know, for instance, when people are in emergency situations, they're most much more likely to do reflex thinking and like their biases are much more likely to come to the surface and they are much more likely to discriminate against people. Um, so it's like, how do we like slow things down <laughs> and ensure that people, that care is, can be as protocolized as possible. Now racism is like coming at people daily you know, regardless of what color you are, you are impacted in some way, whether you're the person enacting racism or you're the person on the receiving end. And so we need to be able to have structures and policies in place that are like counteracting that all the time. You know, I, I guess what, and I think this maybe kind of goes into a point that Adiola was bringing up earlier. And one of the concerns I have is that with us not being prepared for COVID-19, and then having to reallocate a whole lot of resources this is to respond to it. And then the fact that everyone is uh, working from home and the, and the fact that there's probably going to be a lot less money that's just available in, you know, city and government budgets for just running the, um, you know, running our cities such as New York. What can be done or what should we d be doing when we're having this conversation about budgeting and public health systems and making sure that there's a priority so that communities like ours, you know, don't get the short end of the stick, um, whether it's a second wave or whether it's whatever the next mm -hmm. uh, public health crisis is. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I think when people are saying they want X, Y, Z, then what's always asked for is like the data, like what's the data to show this? And the reality is like, we know what works. Like we know that when people have jobs, when people are housed, um, when people are ha have schools are at good schools that are invested in them, like that we see less crime. I mean, we see better health outcomes. Like these are things that we know. Um, and when people ask for sort of what, the, what are the data, for instance, on defunding the police, like what was the data on justifying mass incarceration? Like, yeah, so, the, so a lot of these questions around like, data and justifying is, is really about um, keeping people distracted. Um, and people talk about the work of racism is really to keep people distracted um, from the issues. So we know that all these things work. We can look to other countries also if people need data um, and also communities here in the United States to show that when we invest in these different sectors that this has a positive effects for everyone. We also have crime at um, record low, record low. So I mean, whether we don't, we can keep our we can keep ourselves safe. We can think about very large budgets that are being um, devoted to law enforcement versus the public health system versus education, and just see right there um, how a redistribution could have benefits for everyone in a community. Right, and um, in these last five minutes that we have, we would love for you to talk more about um, considering that there may be a second wave of COVID. How can black and brown communities uh, prepare themselves um, and stay safe uh, for what's to come, which no one knows yet. Right, there's a lot of data that suggests, it, so this is gonna be with us for a while, um, COVID-19, probably the next year or two, even if we find a vaccine, just in terms of 
the time it takes to, to, de to, do, to be able to develop it widely and distribute it widely will take a very long time. So even if they're like, in September, yay, we found one, to be able to get to like the billions of people on Earth, um, it's going to take a while. Um, so with that as our reality, um, I think figuring out like what are things that we can do that are within our control. Um, and so that can be really challenging, but I think for instance, like we've seen like mutual aid networks um, spring up. I have um, a childhood friend who developed a mutual aid network in Prospect Heights, Brooklyn, where community members are taking care of more vulnerable members of the community, such as like older people, you know, just making sure getting people's groceries, running errands. Um, and I think just that in of itself, these are examples of the way that we can um, take care of ourselves and not be um, reliant on others to be able to do that. So I think there's like all of those community efforts that are important. I think we also need to continue to demand increasing resources for our community. So I know, for instance, um, so testing now is much more widely available, obviously throughout New York City, but I know the health department and the, the city have a particular focus on areas that have been disproportionately impacted and that um, there's a neighborhood prioritization um, effort that's going on that's supposed to be infusing many of the communities that have been impacted with more resources around testing um, and contact tracing and telehealth resources for um, providers. So I think that will be helpful, but I think also I think as um, Samuel Roberts, who was part of the panel that I was like last on earlier in the week was talking about just like, we need preparedness in all like sectors. So not just like the healthcare system, um, we need it, you know, in, within our schools, and our, just every aspect. And I think that's gonna be really the, the challenge because we need, there needs to be like a political will to do so. And don't put our lives at risk are really important. So I think just continuing to like advocate and to support one another. And I think also supporting organizations that um, focus on uplifting black people, um, particularly those who are most marginalized, black trans people, like all of it, um, older people, supporting those organizations as much as we can. But it's, it's a lot. Yes, it is. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. I know that we could have this conversation um, forever, but unfortunately we are out of time. So we want to thank you so much for joining us, and we want to thank you for watching Raising the Bar with the MBBA on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. See you next time. Thanks Bye. for having me.